Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Welcome to episode one of Careering, Daisy Buchanan's raucously funny satire on the world of glossy magazines, performed by me, Ellie White, and Ruth Everett. Imogen is stuck in a grim flat share, working a portfolio of jobs to get by, including unpaid intern and sex blogger. She's hustled for years to get into magazines and could maybe, perhaps, finally be on the brink of her dream job. And just to warn you, expect some sex and strong language along the way. Imogen. Through sharing my most audacious desires, audacious or outrageous? Outrageous desires with my rapidly growing readership. I am confident. Oh, is that too much? How do I convey that I'm dazzlingly and uniquely talented while sounding just the right amount of desperate, available and cheap? The best thing about being exiled to the fashion cupboard is that it guarantees a little privacy for personal admin. For all of my efforts, it's possible that no one in the Flair HR department will even read this letter. No one can be bothered to read beyond Imogen Mounts, 26. There's probably another intern, a Millicent or an Isabel, who's already in situ, lined up for the role with all the right qualifications. Uncles on the board, old school friends on the beauty desk. Maybe I should go for broke and tell the truth? If nothing else, it would make the application stand out. Through setting up a sex blog and describing some of the most intimate and embarrassing details of my life, I've gained writing experience, even though no bloody newspapers or magazines will let my words anywhere near their pages. I'm desperate for a day job, I'm very, very tired, and I'm fed up with supplementing my part-time bar work with odd shifts at the pen factory. Without warning, the acting editor sticks her head around the door. Everything okay in here, Imogen? How are you getting on with the box of doom? Ah, Hello, Harry. Uh, Yep, sorry. I throw my phone behind me and lunge for the box. I'm supposed to be untangling necklaces and returning them to their rightful press offices, not applying for magazine jobs on panache time. Still, it's not as if panache are paying me. Harry smiles. I've got to pop upstairs for a bit. I've been summoned by the boss man. How does she do it? Harry is a human toothpaste advert. A three-year-old child could identify her as the editor of a fashion magazine. But I have absolutely no idea how old she is. There's a whisper of a wrinkle in the corner of her eyes, and I can't work out whether she has perfect skin or access to the most expensive Botox going. Probably both. I've never seen another person with hair as shiny as hers in my life. And she has eyebrows like Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, she's warm. She says hello. She asks how I am. She's never once addressed me as oat latte, unlike most of the fashion team. She's decent. And she's always in immaculate black. Although not today. She's in a fitted flowery dress splodged with pink and green. Thanks, Harry. See you tomorrow. I hope it... Can I say I hope it goes well when I'm not sure I'm allowed to know what it is? Thanks for today. You've been ace, as always. Ace. Harry Kemp, industry legend, thinks I'm always ace. That'll keep me warm at night when my numb, inky fingers are wrapped around a polystyrene cup of Nescafe. That's enough to make me smile when my alarm goes off after three hours sleep and I haul myself out of bed to do it all over again. I'm not an idiot. I know I've been sent to the cupboard because something has happened. But today, I think it might be something good. Rosa left Panache a month ago, leaving Harry as acting editor. The new editor's about to be announced, and it's going to be Harry. And if Harry is made editor-in-chief, I think she might give me a real job. Harry. Will has been speaking without stopping for seven minutes now. He's rambling. Long-term service to the company. In recognition of your talent and considerable ability, we think... Harry wants to savour this moment, but she can barely concentrate. The cover interview hasn't been confirmed. Seven suitcases of couture gowns are stuck in customs. 
She wonders whether she can sneak a look at her emails by peering into her pocket, but she has no pockets today. She is wearing the dress, bought the very second she felt sure of her promotion. Most editors wear black, 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 but the editor-in-chief wears Erdem. So we're pleased to offer you an exciting new challenge, says Will, not making eye contact. Harry laughs. Well, it's not too new. I know Panache inside out. Hmm, says Will, clasping his hands in front of him. That's the thing. We think you need a change. Uh, we've decided we want to go ahead with the new product idea, the online magazine for younger women. We want you to be at the helm of the new launch. Right. Right. Harry can feel the cogs of her brain whirring, trying to absorb this information. So, a uh, lot of work. Exciting work. But how would that fit in with my role at Panache? Harry... Will cuts her off. You're not the new editor-in-chief of Panache. I see. Harry doesn't consider herself to be much of a reader of poetry, but as she feels her soul fly from the room, seeping through the glued shut windows, she finds herself remembering a fragment of Audre Lord. Something about being non-essential, wrong, worn thin. Will that be all? No, that isn't right. Ask a normal question. I mean, who will the editor be? Will gulps. It's Mackenzie Whitaker from Hudson, US. Oh, was she on Glamour or Mademoiselle? Lucky? I never came across. No, no, things with a different profile. A uh, gofish, uh, the racing hound. But Panache is a woman's lifestyle title, and I would have thought you'd want someone with experience in the sector. Harry, we need to make significant changes in terms of how we cost the magazine, and Mackenzie knows money. Don't worry, I'm sure she'll still want your editorial expertise. Yeah, that bitch can whistle for it, thinks Harry, as she says. Of course, you know how much I care about Panache. After all, it's been my life for ten years. Another polite, tinkling laugh. This time she is laughing at herself. Because what kind of fool reaches the end of her forties with so little to show for herself? No big job, no personal life to speak of, a tiny flat that still feels far too big, and a mortgage that is definitely too big to permit Harry to speak what's truly in her heart and tell Will to go fuck himself. Will still has the audacity to look relieved, Harry imagines herself fading from high to low definition, her outline flickering and blurring, leaving the office a ghost. So you'll need to start research and assemble your team while you're phased out of your role at Panache. By the way, you are... you look really nice. Special occasion? Harry tugs at the skirt of her treacherous, overpriced editor-in-chief dress. No, not at all. Just fancied a change. Where's the champagne? Did we get a cake in the end, or...? Hiding behind the door, Harry can picture Giles, her fashion director, who calls himself her Girl Friday, scampering about. She knows he'll be organising the straggling staffers who are sticking around, desperate to celebrate her good news. There is no way she can go back into her own office. Not tonight. Blinking hard, she sends Giles a message. Then she stumbles over the road to the Angel and waits. Harry and Giles have seen out many a crisis upstairs at the Angel. It is their war room. All right, Kev? Giles nods at the elderly regular as he dumps four bags of crisps on the table. It's a shame. Acid, they say. The old fellow used to be such a raver down the Blitz every Tuesday night in his leather vest. Careful with your references, Giles, says Harry. Blitz was before you say you were born. If word gets out that you're a day over 35. Ah, oh, I've always been precocious. Harry tears into the cheese and onion. It's so humiliating to be ditched for someone whose biggest career achievement is a stint at the racing hound. Giles pats Harry's forearm. It would be awful if they brought in an Anna. A Kareen. You're not being replaced by an icon. You're the icon. And they want a... What? Anyway, you've not been fired. 
I've been sidelined. It's just... God! Twenty-somethings, Giles. What do they like? What do they know? Who do they fancy? I'd be arrested for lusting after the people they're into. I can't do it. Giles raises his eyebrows. Fractionally. You need to get laid. You always say that. So do you. Let's see if Kev fancies a threesome. Harry is not really in the mood for Giles's nonsense. He will not let it lie. Seriously, when did you last... I mean, it's been a while, yes? A date? A teeny tiny trip out for an itsy bits cocktail? A beckon handsome man? You've always been married to the job. Maybe it's time to go out and meet, you know, a human person. After Andy... Harry shakes her head vigorously and splashes her cheap wine down the front of her expensive dress. No, Giles. I'm going to go home and put my best pyjamas on. I'm giving myself 12 hours to wallow. Then I'm going to work. What was the most challenging aspect of the role? Well, as you know, my character Jennifer falls in love with a village baker and I haven't actually eaten anything containing flour since 2006, so I've never heard of this actress before I was asked to transcribe this interview, but I already hate her. I'm so hungry. I could eat a bag of flour on its own. I rummage under my desk. All I have are some free edible panties. Sex bloggers get sent some very seedy packages. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but they're surprisingly chewy. Imogen, hey. Harry is by my desk, with one hand on my shoulder. She knows. She knows I'm eating edible underwear. Harry, yeah, I was in, um, I was just in the middle of, um, My tongue feels thick and furry, and I chew at it, trying and failing to scrape off the panty coating. I swallow hard. Can you come out to prep for a chat? Treacherous, dangerous hope blooms again. I think this might mean something has happened. Harry orders a macchiato, takes a table and establishes that I would not like a bun or something to go with my filter coffee. Obviously, I long for a bun or something. Anyway, we're launching a brand new online title for younger women and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Your what? 25? I'm panicking. Um, 26. I've missed something vital. Am I being hired or fired? What sort of thoughts? We're looking to launch early next year. We're coming up with a content plan. Our key demographic is a woman who is a little younger than the typical panache reader, 18 to 34, although we're focusing on the 20s, obviously. She's dynamic, ambitious, politically engaged, sexually confident, in fact, that's where you come in. I really love your blog. Your readers are the readers we want. My readers? Uh, right. Great. Your tone is perfect. Funny, frank, insightful, raw. Thank you. I find myself momentarily unable to perform the role of funny, frank sex blogger. Do you have a name for it yet? Harry shakes her head. We need something that sounds sharp and smart, not overly feminine, something about knowledge, being connected. Um, savvy? I say and make a face. No, that's awful. Something about knowledge, power, being in the know? In the know? Something there, maybe. Hypothetically, would you be interested in a full-time contract for this website and available to start in the new year? I can't confirm anything yet. Harry shrugs. Just like everyone else I've met who's in a position to offer me a life-changing job, she's oddly reluctant to admit whether or not there actually is a job. Anyway, tell me, what are you working on at the moment? Pegging, I say. Harry looks blank, so I blunder on. It's a female-led penetration that is a woman, a, a cis woman, usually wears a strap-on dildo and penetrates her partner's anus. It's all about subverting traditional het power dynamics. Harry nods. I know what pegging is. I meant, what are you working on today? At Panache. It's entirely possible that I've just been almost hired, 
then fired. Christmas comes and goes. It's the hope that kills you. And then, after a long, bleak bar shift, I check my emails. Imogen, can you call me first thing? We're on. BTW, we really liked your name. It's the no. H. X. Harriet Kemp, Editor-in-Chief. The No. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts.